Sometime in an unspecified future, the android Alpha sits on the coast with a stranger to watch a silent airplane pass overhead. I wonder if there are people on it, she asks. Yeah, I hear they can't come down no more. They just keep flying. That's all. Two fishermen park their boat in a sea of streetlights. Funny, ain't it? How is it that looking under this trash gives me this feeling? If you ask me, I think people run on light, or sound, or something, when you get down to it. That's all. Two teenagers spend the day saying goodbye to a road about to be forever lost to the rising tide. This road used to be so busy. Soon, it'll be water. And it ain't gonna be the last road that washes out. That's all. These are three of many stories told in the manga Yokohama Kadashi Kiko. Most chapters of this work are like this, strange, gentle tales told in a soft voice that makes few comments and supplies no clear answers. Steady as the ocean, this manga stacks one story after the next in a slow march towards what I have to guess will be an unavoidably quiet end. And after that quiet end, we'll almost certainly follow the two words repeated at the end of each and every chapter. I've been reading this manga for a few months now, usually a chapter or two before bed. It's a story about Alpha, an android girl, and her small seaside cafe whose few customers spend their days cozily commenting on the end of the world. Most chapters are told as little vignettes following one or two characters, and they can be shockingly soothing. Each mostly self-contained story lulls me to sleep like a cup of tea whose warmth I want to ration and slowly savor. After three months of reading, I've not finished this series, and that's unusual for me. It's only 141 chapters, but I'm barely halfway through. Normally I would have devoured a manga that I enjoy enough to talk about on this channel in about a week or two. When I started tracking shots, I read the first 1,000 chapters of One Piece in a month. And this year, I caught up with everything released for Oceanoko and Dawn to Dawn in a week each. These manga are page turners, with intricate plot lines, character arcs, and action set pieces all primed to pull readers along through large binge sessions, where you want nothing more than to keep reading. This is a process I love, by the way, but with Yokohama, I'm taking a different and probably healthier approach. A chapter or two before bed, nothing more. This pace fits the manga well. Its design seems built around lingering on simple observations and ideas. The characters in these stories are often lulled into a contemplative silence by the beauty readily available in their surroundings. They watch dragonflies while sitting in the sun. They dive for glass bottles in the ocean. They take long scooter rides with no clear destination. Each character in this series lives in one of a few small towns or shops, still hanging in there after the world has apparently ended, or is at least close to it. In this world, metropolitan megacities seem like more of a memory, and while some of the relics of the old world remain, life has been given over to grass and wind and sea. When characters leave familiar locations like Alpha's coffee shop or the local gas station, they usually do so alone under the wide open sky. The manga often settles into what becomes a familiar pattern. A character in one location will decide to head out to meet another character somewhere else. Takahiro, the series' young precocious kid, might leave home for the day to visit Alpha at her coffee shop. In a faster-paced series, you would just start the chapter with him arriving where he needs to be. But this manga takes the old, it's about the journey, not the destination philosophy very seriously. Whole chapters are dedicated to characters walking or driving along crumbling roadsides. And when they get where they are going, it's usually to do something as simple as deliver a package or drink a cup of coffee. While researching this series, I learned that it falls under a kind of obscure genre called Iyashike that I think I'm becoming a bit of a fan of. Iyashike, as far as I understand it, is an offshoot of the slice of life genre focused around conflict-free stories that feature characters living in peaceful environments. These are low-stakes, low-investment-required series that are meant to help audiences relax as they watch or read them. While I think Yokohama Kadashi Kiko is the first work I've read that falls under the Ayashike umbrella, I can think of a few different popular series that fit this description. Shows like Girls Last Tour or Laid Back Camp 
stories where it's less about what the characters are doing and more about the feelings you have watching them occupy and interact with a specific setting. A few years ago, I would have never considered reading a series with so little going on on the surface, but I'm happy to report that I'm really enjoying Yokohama Kadashi Kiko, or YKK for short. I think what changed my mind was reading Call of the Night, which often takes a very similar approach to storytelling, where sometimes spending a day or a chapter doing pretty much nothing is the point. These do-nothing chapters have gradually become more and more rare as its story ramps up towards what I suspect is an ending point, but that just makes me treasure them that much more. When you strip away pages of dialogue or fast-paced action, you're left with fewer surface-level details to cling on to as a reader, and you're forced to do a little bit more work to try and tease out meaning from what's left over on the page. Call of the Night is, at least partially, a love story, and it employs this minimal detail technique to really sell you on the intimate moments shared between its protagonists. When you strip away dialogue and action, there's nothing left to focus on other than the two leads' chemistry. Now, granted, the series has a lot more of a traditional shonen plot going on as well, with vampires and magic powers and whatnot, but very quickly, my favorite aspect of the series became the chapters where nothing really happens. YKK has those sort of chapters in spades, and these lackadaisical vignettes are only occasionally interrupted by a melancholic detail about the state of the world. I haven't been getting any customers lately. Uncle, does gasoline... Yeah, it goes bad. This line from a random chapter pops out at me because it's heartbreaking to consider. Gas is very valuable to these characters because it powers their vehicles and connects their spread out communities but it's also an old-world resource the characters in this series have no way to replace. Once it goes bad, that's it. The characters don't seem to dwell on these unfortunate realities about their world, but the weight of those truths is still felt in YKK's sparse story. The world is fading, and soon humans will fade from it and leave Alpha and the androids like her to inherit whatever's left. That's all. YKK and Call of the Night are not just sometimes similar in form, but also tone. Both are prone to moments of profound… sadness? Melancholy? I don't think that's quite it. They can be sad, but empathetic is probably a better description. Call of the Night turns its lens towards characters who don't quite fit into society. Vampires, obviously, but also a teenage delinquent who has trouble understanding normal people. YKK's cast is similarly focused on people with uncertain futures. Alpha's friends in the story are mostly old people or children, and both groups elicit sympathy from the reader. The older characters because they remember how things used to be, and the younger because they will never know. By setting this series in a post-apocalyptic world where so much of society has been lost, what remains is brought into sharper focus. If you mix these old-world blues together with pages and pages of outstandingly well-drawn landscapes, you're left with a reading experience that demands you stop to find your own meaning in the art itself, while also treating every sparse line of dialogue with more weight. I have found the act of reading this manga to be both moving and meaningful, and what I get out of it is this. When I read YKK, I'm left with a gentle reminder to consider my fellow humans with sympathy, understanding, and love. I'm reminded that the world is fleeting, and our time on it more so. And yeah, I probably shouldn't need a manga about an android coffee shop owner to remind me of these things, but hey, whatever works.